plants can take gaseous carbon in the form of CO2 and turn it into plant stems and leaves. So those are organic forms of carbon. And once that organic carbon is present in an ecosystem, it can kind of take a couple different paths. It can persist in that plant biomass, which is what we see when we look at a forest or when we look at woody vegetation. That's carbon that once was carbon dioxide. It's now in that bowl wood or the branches and it's sticking around. Um, carbon that's uh, been converted into organic forms by plants can also fall onto the ground as leaf litter or crop residues and the microbes can work on those crop residues and as they begin to, to decompose them, carbon dioxide is lost. So that's a loss from the ecosystem. Um, but in some cases, those residues find their way into the soil and they can be you know, physically protected or chemically protected or isolated from microbial populations that would chew them up. And that carbon can persist. And that's kind of when we start talking about soil carbon sequestration. Um, it's carbon that's made it into the soil um, and in a number of different kind of mechanistic ways has been protected from decomposition. So this kind of interplay between plants and microbes is constantly happening. Um, kind of over the course of a long period of time, if more carbon comes in than leaves, we would consider that the ecosystem is a sink of carbon and it's sequestering carbon. Um, if on the other hand, more is leaving, then those plants are able to pull in, we would say it's a source or it's um, losing carbon. And, and I just wanna throw out that the, the, the term sequestration sounds, um, at least to me, it evokes this idea that we've locked something away forever, um, but these are living systems. And um, while there is carbon that is in our soils, that's thousands, multiple thousands of years old, um, if the right microbe can get to it, it can disappear pretty quickly. So these things are dynamic. Thank you. And just the last question on there is why should we care about it, right? What's the, what's all the fuss about carbon and, and storing it? That's directed at me too? Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, um, I mean, everybody's aware or hears a lot about um, climate change. Um, and when we think about the big pools of carbon in the world that we have to work with, um, you know, the vast majority of carbon on the planet is in the ocean hands down. Kind of like the, the next big pool is the fossil carbon pool, which we put in um, uh, fossil, you know, like we're burning in our cars or in coal fire power plants. But when we talk about things kind of from the surface of the soil or from, from the soil up, um, the soil carbon pool is the largest pool. Um, you know, it's about three times the size of all of the carbon that exists as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's more than twice the size of all of the living organisms, trees, et cetera. Um, and so if you were to combine, you know, that tree biomass and that plant biomass and the soil biomass, it dwarfs, that carbon pool dwarfs the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. So um, our management of it isn't just this kind of pie in the sky idea of like, maybe we could capture a little carbon or maybe we're gonna lose a little carbon. It's a major lever influencing uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Um, and so it does provide at least theoretically um, uh, a way to, to slow down um, uh, radiative forcing associated with carbon dioxide. Thank you so much for, for setting the stage there on that one. Um, now, Josh, Jonathan, and Jeff, I'm gonna turn it to you. Each of you is with an NGO and in the business of trying to get more landowners, especially smallholder landowners um, who've traditionally been left out involved in carbon markets. Could you briefly lay out for us sort of how carbon markets work, who's buying, who's selling, uh, what, what relationship between there is between carbon markets and offsets, which is a, a term people might be more familiar with and um, why should we be paying attention to carbon markets? Mike, I can start first if, if, if Jonathan and Jeff don't mind. Um, so to back up a little bit, you know, car carbon markets have been around in various forms for decades now. Um, they've evolved. The, there's there's um, what are called carbon standards um, under, under verification bodies. And there's two really types of markets. There's a compliant, there's compliance markets. What that means is um, there's a law somewhere that compels point source, you know, polluters of carbon or others to basically 
um, control their emissions, ratchet them down over time. So they're under a legal mandate to reduce their emissions. And so that's a compliance carbon market. The, the market that Nature Conservancy deals the most in um, is actually called the voluntary carbon market. And that's a market where um, corporations and things you see like Amazon making an announcement by 2040, you know, that they're going to be carbon uh, and neutral, um, you know, Microsoft, all these large companies that really, um, they're doing this because they think it's the right thing to do for, you know, for the world, for their customers, you know, for their employees. And it's, it's really, they're building it into their business, but they're doing it because it's voluntary. So those are the two types of markets that are out there. Um, and over time, the markets have been um, growing. So the, the good news, if you're a forest land owner right now is, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to sequester carbon naturally. And actually we call them with the Nature Conservancy Natural Climate Solutions. There's actually 21 pathways that we looked at across the globe um, for biosequestration. And forests are really the most um, developed pathway out there right now. And, and uh, also, you know, kind of the most popular for companies to, to invest in, um, to, to hold up, you know, to show the world that they're doing the right thing. So really the, the markets that are out there now, um, I would say, uh, you know, they're, they're growing. They're an opportunity for landowners um, through working with, you know, uh, for-profit, you know, NGOs like the Nature Conservancy and Forest Carbon Works, and AFF and others. There's really, a, um, it's a dynamic space and I would recommend that folks learn about it. So I'm glad you're on this <laughs> presentation. And um, there's opportunities there uh, for folks to, to consider and if it's right for them to, to engage. And I'll, I'll pass it over now to Jonathan or Jeff if you wanna kind of add some more color. And, and I can add some follow-up questions to that actually, which is, you know, your organizations in particular, what role do you play in carbon markets? Do landowners need an organization such as yours to get involved with carbon markets? Um, what, what obstacles do landowners usually face and how, how might you help them overcome those obstacles? Again, that's well, Josh, Jonathan and Jeff. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, so so I'll just jump real quick. Yes, I think landowners need uh, partners in this space. Um, carbon and the carbon verification and standards um, uh, are complex and costly. So a lot of the innovation is, is, is trying to figure out ways to make it more streamlined, um, lo you know, very rigorous and third-party audited, um, lower cost and essentially lower the barriers to entry. For, for landowners. And I'll just, I'll stop there and, and hand it over because I know Jeff Cole's been working on that a lot as well. All right, th thanks, uh, Josh. I can, I can go ahead uh, if you don't mind, Jonathan. Um, I think the only thing I would add to what Josh has said is that th these carbon markets do now have a decade plus and, you know, going on two decades actually of uh, kind of, kind of market, market experience for people successfully transacting um, these, these carbon credits, both to companies buying them to comply with regulations, which, you know, under um, the Paris Accord and um, conceivably the direction things are going in the U.S. could be a growing, uh, a growing market going forward. Um, but very significantly, just this voluntary market. And so the, the, you know, two years ago, the international airlines all announced going forward, they'll be offsetting all of their emissions. And so, that's an example of a voluntary initiative that there's no government forcing this industry to sign up to, but now that they've signed up to it, they're gonna have a very hard time ever undoing that commitment. So a uh, long way of saying that there's a, a, a broader variety of avenues for you know, any forest owner or other carbon project owner to match up and team up with different um, buyers of, of, of these ecosystem services that, that they own and can, can generate more of. And it's um, just a really exciting time to be, to be thinking about this. And there's more, more options than, than there ever have been. Um, I'll stop and let Jonathan take over. Yeah, you guys, you guys covered kind of the, really the kind of ecosystem of carbon markets pretty well. Um, the one thing I'll add is like, in the conservation space, we see this as, as a really huge opportunity, the way these carbon markets are developing. Um, in the past, you know, when we go to forest landowners and we, we try to recommend um, 
good sustainable forestry practices. I mean, the landowners on this call, how many times have you heard someone telling you what you should be doing on your land? This way we can actually come to you guys and say, here's, here's some incentives where you can finally get paid for the, the good management you're doing. Um, so that's, that's really what we're excited about with the development of carbon markets. Great, right, thank you. Actually, on that point, so say you do approach a landowner, where, where do you see the most pushback? You know, where are they hesitant to get involved and how do, you, how do you convince a landowner otherwise that they should be involved in this? in a carbon project. Maybe it's not so cut and dry, maybe they shouldn't be. So and this is John Stewart, a small woodland owner. And from my perspective, the, most of the pushback, and I've talked to many local uh, small woodland owners and have given tours of my property, is the, has been the complexity of trying to get into the market. And that's why Forest Carbon Works has been sort of a, uh, a a means to open the door to, to the carbon market. But it's been so complex that only large, very large uh, industrial landowners have been able to uh, target that market up till now. And it, the key is try, uh, doing exactly what I think Forest Carbon Works is doing, opening that door for small woodland owners. And, and indeed, uh, as I tried to open the door over the last three years, it was a challenge because uh, the industrial uh, forests don't want to see carbon markets here in Oregon because it'll uh, cut into the, their harvest levels. Uh, the state of Oregon is, is concerned about it. So there's pushback coming from that direction as well. A very strong pushback here in Oregon. There, um, when we tried to pass cap and trade uh, in the legislature, our state legislatures walked out on it. The Republican state legislatures walked out and manage to cancel all discussion. So it's, there's a lot of hostility to it, um, unfortunately. Uh, but at the same time, among small woodland owners where you have, to, you have debts coming up every year, it offers a great opportunity to cover the, that money, cover those debts over time. And there's a lot of interest from small woodland owners how they can uh, create a work on their sustainable forest over time. Fantastic, thank you. That's actually a great transition. I was going to ask you, uh, John and Tim, next, um, you're both landowners engaging in these carbon projects. Um, and so thinking about what motivated you to do that. So you've already spoken to that a little bit, but um, I guess the question is to what degree is the environment um, a motivating factor? To what degree is, is economic potential, as you say, um, a motivating factor? It doesn't have to be one versus the other, but, um, um, is there a stronger pull? What's, what's actually, what's the main um, interest there? And was it an easy decision or, uh, so this is for both of you, was, were there serious risks uh, that you thought about, uncertainties, question marks that you had to, to weigh in the balance when you decided to do this? Well, I can take a lead again until, and then Tim can follow up. From my perspective, the, the greatest challenge was the length of time we have to lock up the tree farm. It's a multi-generational lockup uh, for these carbon markets. But I have been managing our tree farm that has tr uh, trees on it that stretch from five years of age now to 120 years of age uh, to focus on uh, creating really high quality timber and managing it for timber. The, the, under this carbon market, I'm not managing just for uh, carbon. I'm managing for the long-term viability of the land. And that's managing all for timber production over time, as well as for the carbon market. The huge advantage that I discovered this year in the carbon market was we, we lost, um, the climate is shifting dramatically here in Oregon. Well, uh, Western Oregon, we've never seen a, a, a long-term drought like we've had. We never, and I spent my career fighting fires here in, in the Pacific Northwest. In, the, in Oregon, uh, when I started my career, a 3,000 acre fire was usually the largest fire we had every year. This year, Oregon lost over a million acres of prime timberland west of the Cascades. That was caused by an unusual event where we had uh, wind patterns that have never hit at that time of the year before. We often have east winds that hit in the middle of the winter in January because of the highs that settle over uh, the Pacific Northwest. This year, in September, at the height of the drought, we had winds of 70 miles an hour blowing down the canyons that just blew through canopies, blew through our forest, destroyed over a million acres. Um, the climate's shifting dramatically, and with that shift, it creates all sorts of problems. One of the problems as I planned some harvest this year, 
it would be impossible for me to hire a logger at this time to come in and do any harvest activity on the property because they're all tied up trying to salvage all those stands that are destroyed. For the next three or four years, it would be impossible for me to find any uh, seedlings to replant any of the land that I harvested, or if I lost my timber, they're, they're having a huge challenge trying to find seedlings, seedlings to replant that uh, timber. The nice thing about this carbon market, a new discovery, is it helps level out those uh, highs and lows that you need when you're harvesting timber. You can only harvest periodically every five uh, to uh, seven years uh, under my management plan. And um, so it provides a, a leveling and, and an oper economic opportunity to help manage that land over time. So it, it's a huge asset, I think, for a small woodland owner to be able to access these markets. Tim, maybe you can add something to that from your perspective on the East Coast. Yeah, the Family Forest Program, Carbon Program, uh, was a very easy decision for us. Um, you know, to this point, mostly the uh, property has been managed mostly on opinion instead of uh, professional help. So having the foresters involved and um, giving us a lot of input and, of course, the money to help with the, you know, with the program. Um, we're currently waiting on um, our assessment from the forester on how to proceed at the moment. Um, for us, it seems like invasive species is a big thing for us in our area. Uh, the, the weather's a little more stable here, I think, in the hills and valleys, but at least I hope so for now anyway. But uh, yeah, it was a very easy decision and I think it's a great program. Excellent, thank you both. That's a really interesting point, the sort of risk management or uh, not risk, the cost uncertainty management, uh, because we often think about the volatility in carbon markets being uh, potentially a challenge, but the way you presented it, John, is more of a, um, more certain than potentially harvesting is in the current climate. So that's, that's a really interesting point. Thank you. Um, okay, Angela and Tony, you are, you represent the other side of this. So you as Menominee tribal community members were given the option, uh, you, you opted not to participate in a carbon project. So I'm wondering, could you speak to the process of decision-making regarding a potential carbon deal first, um, as this would have been a carbon deal on collective Menominee land? Uh, who has to be consulted in that? How is the deal actually made? And then second, uh, what in the end would you say motivated your decision not to, to go with it, to turn down the project? Um, what, were the, what were the perceived negatives in your view? I think Tony can speak. Um on specifics, but just as a parent and member of the community, um, we have a long history of unfavorable um, outcomes when it comes to negotiating with our tribal land and our tribal property. Um, we recognize this and, and um, entering into any kind of negotiation where a lien would be placed on tribal land is, is not an option for us. And, and we have basically one resource here um, that we're able to hand, in, hand over to our children and that's not really negotiable. So even though that the um, <clears throat> amount that would be paid to the tribe for entering into this, it's, it's not favorable and um, the forest resources is much more worth that amount and, and we want to gain or maintain complete control over that resource. Mm -hmm. So um, do you, would you say that if you had had a carbon project in place, um, how, how much would that affect how you would actually manage the forest? Would it, would it be managed much more sustainably in your opinion if you had had the carbon project or are the differences not so stark? Well, I can add a few things. Um, uh, Menominee Forest has been a continuous track to forested land being managed since um, establishment back in the treaties back in 1854. Um, over the years, um, there's been um, essentially different um, conflicts with outside outside entities. Um, there's been different legislation. I think in 1930 there was a Dawes Severalty Act. That was one of one of the ways where the federal government tried to try to um, assimilate the tribes tribes into the rest of society. Um, there's been other other approaches over the years. Um, the tribe was actually terminated back in the 1970s and the tribal members fought to get their land back. Um, as far 
as far as this uh, this last carbon credit um, concept, the tribe was has been approached four different times in the last ten years, and um, the um, the outside organizations have, have kind of they've had good points, they've had good ideas. Um, it's not all a bad thing. It might work. It's it's a complex issue, like John has said. It's very complex. It's, it might work for some, might not work. But as far as um, the forest itself, we've been harvesting timber off the forest and managing it in a sustainable fashion for several hundred years, that or 150 years. Um, so this whole concept of carbon credits came along. Um, actually, the last. The last group came from uh, California industry and they came and they kind of approached the Menominee tribe and uh, I'm actually a tribal member. I don't speak for the entire tribe, but I'm a, I'm one of the land managers. So I can just say what I you know I can say here. Um, they approached, their problem was they, they uh, wanted to do continue polluting us to some degree and they wanted to uh, offset their pollution ability by buying carbon credits and purchasing off the Menominee tribal land. Um, uh, that concept itself struck kind of uh, um, negative negative with the um, tribal members because you're, you're, it goes against the entire philosophy of, of what the tribe was trying to do. They're trying to do, a, um, well, I had a couple points here. They um, Basically, Menominee's cultural based philosophy, historical vision, uh, the goals and objectives of the tribe, management of the forest land, um, the uh, whole carbon credit goes against that concept where you're where you're basically trading carbon credits to allow um, California industry to continue polluting. It just didn't sit well. Um, like John had mentioned, there's a lot of complicated um, other aspects to it. One is the initial measurement of your forest, the baseline measurement that you would do. So I, we have a 230,000 acre tract of forest land. Um, Measuring that will take several years and millions of dollars worth. Um, and who's to say those measurements are, who does the measurements? And then part of the agreement is you have to continue measuring. This because meeting is being recorded. Every five years thereafter. And another point is if you do the, get this agreement, um, this organization wanted to tie up the forest land for 100 years. So whatever decisions are made now and whatever payments are made up now, you're committed to that time period. So there's, there's a lot of things that you have to think about. Um, I think it's a lot simplified if you're not talking about a, a reservation in a, in a tribal tribal organ or a tribal tribal membership who all own the, own the land at once. I think this, this carbon credit idea might you know sit well better with um, smaller groups or smaller organizations. I'd like to add to that also as, as a previous land manager and um, before um, returning to graduate school, um, you know, I often wanted to utilize government um, grants to perform wetland restoration work and, and which required a lien on the property or a conservation easement, which we were unable to participate in because the land was held in trust that we, we had to have a free and clear title. But we were able to negotiate into this carbon credit training. Are trading. So I'm wondering, um, how is that possible? You know, I don't understand um, how the Department of Interior would, would allow such a thing and then reject our request to use government funds to, to restore our properties. And I think that, you know, putting that lien on the property just, it opens up the floodgates for whatever would happen in the future. Uh, we have a program at the Nature Conservancy called the Working Woodlands Program and now have a partnership with um, Brian Van Stippen and the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. And we've been working with uh, uh, tribal, tribal leaders, tribal lands um, for uh, voluntary carbon projects. And um, I heard a lot from uh, the, the, the things you just said, you know, issues around um, your sovereignty, uh, you know, this whole idea of liens conservation easements, encumbrances. And so we're working with folks. Um, we're working uh, to, uh, in other ways that don't require um, exactly what you just said. So I just, I, not, this isn't a sales pitch, but just to say that I, I, I recognize that and I recognize um, the skepticism and, and the history and everything else. And um, 
that, that we're working with. And if you ever wanted to reach out, um, Brian Van Stippen uh, at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, uh, we're, we're working in what in the voluntary space, not the California compliance space. So. Thank you. Well, fascinating uh, perspectives. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, so we've been we've been looking so far mostly at forest carbon projects. Let's turn um, Greg back to you for a second. Your research looks at sustainable agriculture, including considerations for carbon sequestration. Um, what agricultural land use practices are particularly important for increasing carbon storage in ag land, and at what role do you think? carbon markets do or could play in further incentivizing these practices? Are, are they cost prohibitive in the absence of, of this sort of a scheme? Um, those are great questions. Uh, in terms of, you know, the cost prohibitiveness or the details of the um, markets, I probably shouldn't go there. But, um, you know, agricultural systems are a different beast um, because we have to deal with measuring the soil. Um, I mean, Forests are great because the carbon that we're measuring is above ground and, and forestry has got all these great allometric equations where they can take a diameter at breast height and the height of a tree and they know the species and I have this many tons of carbon. Um, in agriculture, you know, it's important to kind of get all of these various tiny methodological considerations correct to actually assess how much carbon you've got in an acre. Um, and so that that's tricky. Um, we certainly have the technology to do all of those things. Um, there's a lot of data out there that was not collected doing all of those things. And that body of data um, drives a lot of kind of uh, um, the discussion around agricultural land management and carbon sequestration. And just looking at the um, uh, the chat here, you know, Tim Bay asked a question and Eric uh, Schmidt uh, responded that, um, you know, in, in agricultural systems paying for um, carbon sequestration, you're really paying for a delta, uh, a change. And so um, what, what they're asking producers to do and they being you know, the indigos of the world um, are saying, okay, if you're growing you know, continuous corn, can you grow continuous corn and then maybe add a cover crop? Or can you grow continuous corn and maybe do no-till? Um, with the assumption that that change is going to make the system perform better than it had been performing with respect to carbon. Um, and so we do have some broad categories that we know generally, um, you know, move the carbon needle, if you will, in, in, a, um, in the right direction. That doesn't mean it's sequestering carbon, but it does mean that we're probably moving in the right direction. So reducing tillage, because tillage oxidizes carbon. Um, which means that it takes your physical carbon in your soil and turns it into carbon dioxide. Um, so reducing tillage is one big thing. Increasing the amount of time a system has living cover, and that's why cover crops have become, become so popular. You know, um, Whenever you see green in a field, um, photosynthesis is occurring unless those plants are dormant, and so they're pulling carbon into that system. Um, you know, one, one of the real beneficial thing somebody could do is have a, you know, perennial um, phases in their rotation. And that could start off being something like, you know, if they've got livestock that they could feed things like alfalfa or alfalfa grass combinations. And then, um, you know, kind of like the practice that's likely to drive you farthest along the carbon sequestration spectrum in an agricultural land would be conversion to grasslands. And that can be working grasslands like grazed pastures, or it could be, um, you know, native uh, grasslands like tall grass prairie or CRP type plantings. And those are much harder cells because you're taking something out of uh, production. But even the idea of, of converting good corn ground uh, to, to grasslands is, is really is a really tricky cell. Um, so, you know, like all of those things being said, I think it's still really critical and, and kind of part of the existential piece of this idea of paying agricultural producers for sequestering carbon is that we know that those practices should lead to more carbon in your soil, but we don't know necessarily that those practices are gonna sequester carbon. So if you're getting paid for a Delta, that Delta might mean that you're kind of slowing the train down on the tracks a little bit. You're, you're emitting less carbon, 
but it doesn't mean that you're sequestering carbon uh, necessarily, and that requires long-term monitoring. Um, uh, and, and so there has to be a process of you know, setting a baseline, appropriate baseline, and then following that baseline at the four-year, you know, 10-year, whatever it is, um, time frame. So in that sense, would you say that carbon markets for agricultural practices are probably not the best way forward, or given the me measurement challenges, are we better off incentivizing via tax incentives and other sort of policy mechanisms? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, A, we know how to track carbon. We can do it right. Um, uh, it just has to occur, um, you know, it has to reoccur over time. So we're actually tracking. Um, from, you know, an accountant standpoint, you know, uh, the carbon dioxide bean counters out there, um, reducing the amount of emission is still beneficial, right? If, if our burn rate, if you will, if we're, if we're losing less because we decided to go no-till or we decided to plant cover crops, that still has a value. Um, and so I think it's still worth um, pursuing those. I just think we need to be honest about uh, what we know is happening. We can't measure those trees standing on uh, up, up above right. the ground. And so we have to be a little bit more um, um, uh, conservative about how we apply those credits. And, you know, carbon sequestration is, is one of many tools you could actually decrease the CO2 equivalent emissions from agricultural systems. You know, reducing nitrogen inputs does a huge job because of the energy it takes to put in nitrogen. I mean, there's lots of ways. Reducing uh, herbicides decreases the carbon footprint of agricultural systems. So, um, Carbon sequestration is part of the levers we can pull in an agricultural um, mm -hmm. uh, systems, but but it's not the only thing. So thank you very much. That's probably a good um, transition to Charlie, um, our general journalist here, who you've been critical of the idea that carbon markets or carbon projects on agricultural lands in particular will play a significant role in tackling climate change. Um, and you question the degree to which there is certainty in, in the carbon storage and soil um, on the science of that and uh, called a focus on carbon sequestration in ag, quote, a, a prime staging area for corporate greenwashing. So I'm sure everyone here wants to make sure that carbon benefits are indeed real and importantly, not a distraction from the need to reduce fossil fuel emissions. So with those real concerns in mind, uh, what limitations would you say to carbon markets and, and ag offset um, projects in particular perhaps have for generating real change and uh, where do they fall short? What do they miss? And um, an extension, uh, what are potential environmental injustice implications um, that might be exacerbated by, by carbon markets? Great, thanks for that question and thanks for having me on. And um, first of all, I just wanna acknowledge that I know that everyone here is committed to a livable future for us and our children. And I'm, I'm just here to be a part of that with all of you. Um, so I think uh, I really appreciate Greg's, um, the way he's illuminated kind of the delicacy and the fragility of the science that we have available and the measurement tools that we have um, for measuring um, sequestration for understanding the movement of carbon through between our atmosphere and our soils. It's a di very dynamic um, system. And from my perspective, I'm going to live well into hopefully the 2070s and on. If I have kids in the next 10 years, um, they could very easily see the year 2100. Um, so when I think about for strategies um, for decarbonization on the times uh, constraints that we have, um, I'm pretty concerned about um, solutions or approaches to this problem that uh, the corporations that run um, the heavily polluted economy that we are living under when they get excited about one of these solutions, it's my job as a journalist to um, try to try to be skeptical and try to understand what's happening. Um, so there's a bill in the US Senate um, that is kind of uh, trying to install uh, USDA as, as a sort of third party arbiter of these 
these sequestration um, exchanges and, and try to like further entrench the system. And when I look at the suite of corporate interests that are supportive of that bill, um, a strategy for um, sequestering, pun intended, um, the kind of the sin of their larger supply chains into um, the hands of well-meaning, um, thoughtful landowners like all of yourselves. Um, I think all of you should be should be able to make a living um, taking care of our land and water and our atmosphere. And I'm so grateful for the work that all of you do. Um, but I get scared um, when McDonald's, Cargill, Walmart, um, and new tech ventures um, such as Indigo Agriculture and all of these new Silicon Valley startups who are largely um, seeking to perpetuate wealth that comes from oil and gas interests. They're, they're in, being invested in by the largest asset managers in the world, by sovereign wealth funds um, and oil interests in India and Saudi Arabia and Alaska. Um, so when I think about this larger system and our, our um, imperative to decarbonize at such like an unthinkable pace, um, when, when these interests um, are latching on to a relatively shaky um, solution and market exchange that preserves their power and preserves the supply chains based on um, unthinkably pollutive and destructive um, practices and um, and production methods. Um, it scares me quite a bit uh, because we have a lot of solutions for approaching the agricultural supply chain and approaching um, forestry um, that we know have unbelievable decarbonization benefits and they don't involve um, all of these structures and, and, and technology and difficult measurements. I mean, to this very day, uh, an agronomist who works for one of these companies told me that um, they actually can't re reliably measure year to year what the delta is on soil carbon, um, which I just found really alarming because uh, billions are being put into this uh, concept and um, it's being laundered as um, uh, these corporations are doing their part to solve this problem. And I have, I have little faith that um, on the, in the grand scheme, this is our way out. Um, so I think, have I complained enough? I think that's all I have um, for the most part. Um, so thanks for listening to me. And I, I would just love to talk more. Anybody who's here who disagrees, um, who sees it differently, um, I, I've had so many conversations from this work um, and I look forward to all of them. Well, I would love to follow up with a million questions of my own, I assure you, um, with all of you. It's really, um, just as I said before, a lot of fascinating perspectives and backgrounds. It's, um, it's wonderful to hear all of your thoughts, but I, in fairness, should turn it over to the audience Q&A um, because I know questions have building, been building up there. So Nico, I will hand it over to you for some follow-up questions. Thanks everyone. Sure, yeah, thank you all for, for all your insights. Um, we really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad we have some time to get to the audience questions because we've had a, a few coming in and, and uh, there's some really interesting ones. So um, kind of um, going off of Charlie, what you were just talking about, um, we have a question here. Oh, and I should just say, um, I, I may address these questions to specific panelists, or I may just um, uh, ask it to the whole group. Um, so um, this first question here that I wanna talk about um, kind of concerns a little bit what Charlie was talking about. And um, the question is, carbon markets allow landowners to sell carbon credits and polluters to buy them. Are there also company, and, and there are companies like um, those on the panel who help lower barriers um, to entry in the market. Um, as someone who's largely ignorant of the inner workings of these markets, what are the sinks of capital flow? Um, which is a good plan where it's love it. What are the sinks of capital flow? Um, who's making the profit and ultimately where's the largest source of funding? Is it federal, private? Um, so, um, I'll, Charlie, you can speak to this, but also um, Josh and, and Jeff and Jonathan, I think 
um, could also speak to this well. So if any of you want to jump in. So this is this is Josh and Charlie, you're great making some great points. Um, maybe just give folks a little background on the Nature Conservancy's approach um, to carbon credits, carbon offsets, and decarbonization. Um, you know, if you look at the Paris Agreement in 2050, we you know we view carbon credits in these markets and you know nature-based solutions as a bridge um, to get to a lower uh, lower carbon world um, or a net you know net, a neutral world by 2050. And you know the, the companies we are working with, we actually want to see that it's not just greenwashing. So a company, uh, you know, so so you know some of the concerns I heard as well, you know, that we're just you know they're buying X and then they're doing Y, you know, that they've been doing forever, and they're not going to change because they just factor X into the cost of doing business. So what we look for are companies that that are making actionable plans and syncing up with things like the Paris Agreement. And looking at the 2030 goals, and what we found is companies that that meet those criteria, and this is in, in the ecosystem marketplace. This is a published piece. Are investing 10 times more in reductions, and that's really what we need. You know, we need reductions. We need you know new innovation, and 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 just a complete, uh, as Charlie said, a massive uh, shift in in how we do most things in the world. Um, so, 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 you know, there, there's that. And then in terms of capital flows, uh, you know, on, for the voluntary market space, I mean, it's, it's mostly corporations are the ones, the fuel to um, then return most of the payments. Obviously they go back to the landowners because they're the ones with the assets and, and changing behavior and, and doing things with carbon benefits. So it's, it's mostly, it's mostly uh, you know, uh, corporations at this point. Um, and, and, you know, and then if you're in the compliance market, it's, it's the, you know, it's all of the, uh, you know, point source submitters that are covered under the, under the, um, under the legislation there. Yeah, I guess I just would, I just would, I just would follow on to what Josh said and said, you know, I, I think it's completely uh, important to any company who's using offsets to look at how they're using them and are they using them in the context exactly, as Josh said, of a bridge to a lower carbon, uh, lower carbon reality, and do they have a credible plan in place to actually use this as a bridging mechanism to get there, as opposed to saying, hey, we're using offsets and leaving it, uh, leaving it that. Um, and, um, and, and so, yes, I, I mean, there's very little, I guess, government money that's going into these programs currently. It really is private dollars from the companies who are, who are um, you know, using these carbon benefits as part of their plan, um, ideally, uh, who, are, who are funding this. And then those proceeds, yeah, the, the lion's share should go back to the, the landowner and then the, the facilitators and aggregators who are helping along the way are, are getting paid for um, for their efforts uh, along with you know the, the the verifiers and boots on the ground and you know there's a lot of uh, I guess ancillary services that go into these um, projects as well and so there's there's um, portions of, of all of this that's 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 going to those um, end uses as well and I'd love to add a little bit about um, what we talk about when we talk about landowners, kind of the like the recipient side of um, this ecosystem. Um, I think we have some small landowners on, I think we have a lot of, I mean, I know that in farming we have um, small farms can uh, very committed to stewardship. And we also have um, a large, like large, large swaths of agricultural and forest land that are corporate owned. Um, and there's a strong, um, there's kind of a, a wealth cycle in which um, land, large corporate landowners will have and asset managers have a vested interest in um, seeing their land value appreciate um, through um, flows of, of commodities um, and other um, uh, value creation on private markets and a government solution that retires this land directly um, doesn't pro it, it extracts that um, land from a profitable um, at least in farmland this is something you can add on to um, the the commodity production 
um, system. And that's a very, that's part of what makes, or that's almost the only thing that makes farmland so valuable is its ability to produce as much corn and soy out of those, out of that soil as possible. Um, whereas we, we know that the, the sequestration benefits are exponentially um, better if we just let that land sit. Um, so that's, that's something I'd like to keep in mind. Great, thank you. Um, the next question I want to kind of focus on on what uh, what kind of management landowners um, can can do, and what kind of management is um, required by such by contracts like in carbon markets. And I wanted to um, quickly let um, Tony and Angela kind of talk about what their forest management practices are and what their goals are, and how that might have changed um, if they were to participate in a carbon market. Um, I think that'd be really interesting to hear about. Question is how things would change in the carbon market. Yeah, if there were if there were certain um, if there were certain ways that the management um, would would change if if it were under um, if you were in the carbon deal and and how goals would change potentially. Um, uh, just a couple quick things. Um, the uh, the um, forest is managed sustainably so that over the years, if you measure the volume of timber on standing volume of timber, um, it's harvested in such a way that the forest is, is harvested so that everything, it's constantly replacing itself. So in respect, this, the forest is, is uh, you're able to extract timber off the forest, logs, trees, but never do it in a way where you, you don't take more than what the forest can replace itself. So when the, uh, carbon credit concept came along, they said, just keep doing what you're doing and uh, we'll basically write you a check. And um, it's not that simple. Um, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of things to look into. Um, one of the things was um, you have to basically maintain your baseline of, of uh, productivity or your amount of, of uh, carbon on the forest. Um, so two things were who measures that? How much time does it take to measure? And then, how accurate is it to say 10 years from now that you're still above that, that baseline level? Um, and one other concept was, um, what if there's a, what if your, part of your forest burns? What if there's invasive species come along, decimate part of your forest, your, your productivity level drops below that level? Um, what, what happens then? Do you owe money back? Do you have to pay back for that? Um, Especially with a contract agreement that goes on what a hundred years, I mean, how can you how can you say what's going to happen 30, 40 years from now? Is that productivity level going to still maintain it at that point? Um, but overall, um, the the Menominee tribe is able to extract um, in economical. Um, um, they're able to gain from the uh, the, the um, sawmill, the lumber industry that they're selling to pulpwood markets. Um, bringing on the carbon markets was another complication saying um, they basically wanted you to stop um, taking carbon off the land by cutting trees. So that if we don't, if you don't do that, is that the best way to manage your forest? That's a big question, you know, letting it just kind of age and, um, you know, age, is that the best answer? So. Great. Yeah, thank you. And I think that it goes well into another question. Um, that we had about balancing kind of those those um, management goals in different ways, right? So um, a question we had was what civil cultural practices are prohibited in a carbon project? Um, and also how you might balance um, uh, managing for carbon storage and man managing against things like fire um, if you're in the West or like you said, for timber harvest. So I'd be interested to hear kind of how those are, are balanced either from um, our NGO folks or from either the uh, private landowners who have kind of experience in 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 their own management. I, I mean, if I could just I'll, I'll offer briefly. I mean, there's no uh, prohibition against against timber harvesting or fuel treatments or anything else under under a forest carbon project. Um, anytime you do remove carbon from the site, that does reduce the amount of carbon credits that one is generating. And past a certain um, point, one can, um, you know, generate a deficit, which needs to be, um, which needs to be essentially paid back. Um, 
But to your other point, if there's a deficit that's caused not by a harvest decision, which can be planned for, and if one chooses to you know, take that carbon off, one can choose to do so and, and pay the carbon back or not. But if there's a natural event, um, you know, infestation, fire, wind event, or something else that's taking out carbon, all of the current standards that I'm aware of basically sets aside an, an insurance pool of a certain amount of credits that comes off of every project so that you know, any individual landowner that suffers a natural uh, occurrence it has no has no liability for that. At least in the, the, the programs I've worked I've worked with. Uh, I will add uh, from my perspective of a small landowner. Before I could get into this, I had to have a very highly developed management plan designed uh, for over time. And by applying that plan, I'm looking at different species of trees. I have alder here in the Pacific Northwest. It matures at about 60 years of age versus a Douglas fir that can grow to three to 500 years of age. So I can manage different types. In the management plan, I'm designing for harvest levels uh, for the alder 60 years out, for thinning for the Douglas fir to, um, for some of them to reach perhaps that maximum age. Who knows? I cannot plan 500 years out, but I can plan, you know, a century or so. So a lot of it is having a very intensive management plan focused around timber harvesting because you're trying to protect the land from disease. You're trying to protect the land from fire. You're trying to protect the land from wind throw. So a management plan tackles all that. And in designing this management plan for a long period of time, uh, I think the carbon market can reinforce it and, and give it um, more structure and create a far healthier ecosystem. Great, thank you. Um, and kind of on this um, train of thought of, of small, of, of what we've ta been talking about is of small landowners, right? Small private landowners. Um, we had a question, um, a, a clarification about how small is small for a woodland owner. Um, maybe is, is someone, does someone with 10 to 20 acres, um, can they apply for these carbon programs? Um, and then another question came in related to that about um, potential for aggregating many small holdings into one. Um, so I'd be interested to hear about that. Um, I can say for the Family Forest Carbon Program, we work currently with people who have between uh, 30 and 2,400 acres of forested land. Um, we've looked at the at the aggregating already, um, and we're just like probably a little too early in our program right now to uh, really build out aggregating a bunch of small properties. But it's definitely something we have our eye on and want to want to get to in the future. I don't know, Josh, if you can speak any more yeah. on that. So, so the one the one interesting thing about the Family Forest Carbon Program is it goes about um, aggregation in a little different way. It does it much like the in the agriculture side with practices and field practices we have um, for basically forest carbon practices. So a landowner actually is signing up. So like, like Tim uh, here on the call, um, they're signing up for what's called growing mature forest. So that practice is what they're agreeing to and they're agreeing to a 20 year term. This is a VCS protocol we're building out right now, verified carbon standard. Um, and within that, you know, what we want to see from an NGO on the forest side is, you know, them looking at their forest health, figuring out how it meets their goals and objectives and, and creating plans that essentially make the property more resilient, you know, more productive, more diverse, because that's really in light of all of these things, you know, diversity, particularly in Eastern deciduous forest is really important. Um, so yeah, we're, we have this, pra it's called, it's, it's, it's a <clears throat> practice-based approach and then landowners actually get paid for the practice. Um, and then, and then um, American Forest Foundation, uh, Jonathan and TNC, then we go out and actually we'll, we'll, we'll verify and bring the carbon credits to market. And then that carbon credit payment is then the fuel that pays, you know, pays for the payments we just made to the landowners for the carbon practices. And we're targeting, I mean, our goal is between 75 and 80 cents on the dollar goes back to the landowner. So that's how we're trying to really stay efficient and true. And that's, that's a really high return rate back to a small landowner down to 30 acres right now. Yeah, and speaking for Forest Carbon Works, we're, we're looking at, we're looking at uh, family forest, you know, under 100 acres. And so also trying to push that envelope, uh, you know, ever downwards. 
and a little bit different approach, um, actually measuring, doing carb, not just pra not practice-based approach, but uh, an, an inventory-based uh, methodology. Um, and again, using these technologies, trying to do that with a, a smaller and smaller uh, land base without, without necessarily aggregating um, multiple landowners together, just at this point trying to, um, at this point enabling folks to do it on a standalone basis. Great, and, and to kind of wrap things up um, and go off of what we were just talking about, um, I think our, our last question um, will be, um, where would you recommend that a private landowner start if they're interested in getting involved in carbon markets? Um, you know, where, where should they start from an NGO perspective? Where did you get started, Tim and John? Um, I think that'd be a great way to kind of wrap up our discussion. We here got started through the, the Nature Conservancy um, with the Family Forest Park program, uh, carbon program. Um, you know, as Josh was explaining on there, um, the, the, how their program works, from our family's experience on this, you know, they're, they're basically paying us to do something we were going to do anyway. You know, this, this property is going to be there for hopefully more generations than I can think of. And uh, now they're helping us do it a little more professionally, you know, so that it stays healthier and combating, you know, what may come at us in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. So a 20 year commitment was, was a no brainer. You know, it's a, it's really for us, it's a, it's an all around win. So it's been great. And, and from my perspective, I started, I actually spent my career working for the U S forest service and I, um, it has a brain trust called the Pincho Institute. And the Pincho Institute received a federal grant to try to jumpstart uh, carbon sequestration on private industrial lands. As part of that, they had AmeriCorps members come out and use the new app that Forest uh, Works had developed to, to, to assess uh, the carbon sequestration on the land. Um, I worked very closely with them. It took us almost three, uh, three years to make sure that that app was accepted by uh, California uh, for their carbon uh, uh, system. It was a real, and it was a challenging process. Literally, they, again, the industry is not very supportive of carbon sequestration. And they wanted, I think they wanna make it as difficult for small landowners as possible to access it. And fortunately, uh, Forest Carbon Works is trying to work around that up until um, I got our land certified, um, I think the smallest uh, industrial lands were in you know, 5,000 acres or something like that. So to have a 120 acre forest parcel of a fairly small woodland certified was a huge breakthrough. Literally, it was demanded to be cruised three times before they would accept it. And now they've accepted the system that Forest Carbon Works has set up, but the pushback from industry, not only the forest industry, but the you know the people that are buying these carbon credits was pretty significant, and I can see it out there. They aren't terribly. I mean, Charlie, you're saying <laughs> they're fighting it, and they're fighting it in many different ways, and by making it difficult for small woodland owners to access this. And you have to have somebody, uh, an intermediary like Forest Carbon Works, to help you through this. We don't have the legal system, small woodland owners, to access this. So. I think having um, uh, somebody on our side that supports us and ha has developed a system that's simple for small women owners to, to access the system is critical. And we're working in that direction. It's gonna be challenging as time goes on, but I think we've started, and uh, from what I understand, there's a number of uh, small women owners here in Oregon that I know that are now signed up under Forest Carbon Works and getting their land certified, but it's challenging, it's not easy. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, we are at the end of our time here. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, but um, we will send you a follow-up email with more opportunities to engage in this discussion and learn more about all this. Um, we're so glad to have all our panelists here. Um, thank you, Kylie, for co-moderating. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to um, wish you all a good evening um, and uh, a safe rest of the year. Um, and yeah, 
Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it.